Um, we're going to use mics because it is being recorded by Channel 17. Thank you very much. Um, so even for the Q&A, we'll pass a mic around, so please make sure you use it. So thanks for coming to this evening, um, part of our Critical Conversations series that's part of the Emergent Landscape class for the Masters of Fine Arts in Emergent Media <laughs> at Champlain College. Um, so thanks for being here tonight. Um, tonight we have, I'm going to look at my notes, um, our talk is called Engagement and Community in the Digital Space, Reflections from the Arts and Humanities. Um, and to tell you a little bit before I introduce our speakers, I'll tell you a little bit about the class that, um, that this speaker series is part of and about the program. So the master's programs in emergent media are interdisciplinary programs designed to give graduate students the opportunity to gain a deep understanding of how humans interact with and are impacted by technology allowing them to become thought leaders and designers of media solutions for tomorrow. Um, so our students are learning about how to evaluate the social impacts of technological innovations and communications processes, and they're using media in new ways to address creative business, social, and education challenges and to make a difference in the world. So this class is um, an introductory class to, it's called The Emergent Landscape and it's designed, it's a, sp a speaker series course that's designed to introduce students to kind of a wide range of different ways of thinking about um, technology in contemporary society, really. Um, we've worked, we've had people from the healthcare space doing human-centered design, we've had generative um, artists and technicians um, we've had people from the digital humanities, um, we've had musicians, I don't know, who else? A lot of others. <laughs> I'm missing a few, I'm sure. So today, um, I'm happy to welcome Peter Gilbert and Karen Middleman to join me for a conversation about, um, about again, engagement and community in the digital space. I should have brought water, a glass of water. Oh well, <laughs> you'll have to deal with my uh, cotton mouth. Um, so the idea for this particular presentation began actually this summer when I had the privilege of being on the hiring committee f uh, for the new executive director for the Vermont Arts Council. And we had the pleasure of interviewing, I had the pleasure of interviewing Karen Middleman, who in the middle of the interview started talking about her vision for the arts in Vermont and how um, important digital media and, um, and the game space was to her vision for um, the arts and humanities in the 21st century. And she and I started getting into this conversation, this side conversation in the middle of the interview and I, we had to stop ourselves. <laughs> so I, so I, we, we chose her for the position and we brought her here and now I get, to have, um, I get to have this evening. So I'm very excited to introduce Karen Middleman. She has a PhD in US history um, and published her first novel in 2016. She was, prior to being the newly minted uh, executive director at the Vermont Arts Council, we're on month two. She was the director of the Division of Public Programs at the National Endowment for the Humanities. In addition to that, she held a senior position at the National Museum of American Jewish History and was a curator at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Um, Karen and I started talking about this particular talk uh, early on in her tenure at the Arts Council, about a month ago. <laughs> Actually, before she officially started, six weeks ago. <laughs> and she immediately said, let's invite Peter Gilbert, who is our other guest, and he is the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council. So we emailed Peter and set up a phone conversation, and the first thing he said to us on the phone was, I have no idea why you want me to participate in this conversation. <laughs> I don't know anything about the digital space or you know, how it impacts the future of humanities and arts. And Karen and I both said, that's exactly why we want you to participate in this, con in this conversation. So I told him at the beginning, just before, that he's the, light the Luddite of the group. And so he can help us kind of probe and ask questions from kind of a different perspective. Um, in addition to being the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Council, Peter is a former litig litigator and teacher of English and history at Phillips Academy. He also was senior assistant to the president and associate provost at Dartmouth College. And this was, I thought, the most interesting. Since 1992, Gilbert, or Peter, sorry, <laughs> 
<laughs> my notes. Peter has also served as um, Robert Frost's literary executor. So um, yeah, so there you go. So um, I'm gonna start with Karen. She's gonna talk a little bit about her time at the National Endowment of the Humanities and some of the work she did in bringing digital media projects to, um, to the NEH. And then um, we'll have a conversation. And we hope that you guys will participate um, in that conversation as well. So, thank thanks, you. Robin. Is this? Do I have to turn this on? And Can I'm going to turn me? on the TV behind her because we're going to need it okay. in just a minute. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thanks for being here. Uh, first, I have to clear something up. I am not. Um, this is not the tech person and the Luddite. I am much <laughs> closer to. Uh, Peter than it might seem. I don't come to this conversation as a tech person at all. I am trained as a historian and a museum curator, and I really started thinking about the digital space and the possibilities of digital humanities as a funder when I was at the NEH. So we had, when I've been at the, had been at the NEH for 20 years about, and we had a very vibrant digital humanities program that was founded, I want to say, 10 years ago. But in my division, the Division of Public Programs, we, we really weren't doing much in the digital space. And most of what was going on in digital humanities was very academic. Not to knock academics, but it was not aimed at the public. And my mission was public education. The Division of Public Programs funded a wide range of, of public program formats that delivered humanity, humanities ideas to the public. So documentary film, radio, museum exhibits, historic site interpretation reading groups in local libraries, um, you name it. Any, any format that brought humanities ideas to a wide public, that's, that's what we did, except for digital. We had kind of shied away from that. And about five years ago, six years ago, I said, this is crazy. You know, We have to explore this digital space and figure out a way to, to play a leadership role. There was tremendous apprehension at the time in my field, in the museum field, about the potential of the digital space. It may be hard for the students here to appreciate this, but the first reaction of a lot of folks in the museum field was to you know, kind of be terrified by digital. They were convinced that if museum collections were put online, for example, no one would come in their doors anymore, that no one would want the real stuff. We know that's, that, that's not what happened, in fact, that digital engagement drives people to want to engage more deeply with the real stuff. But there was tremendous fear and apprehension and resistance. So, okay, so fast forward to, 2014, we finally pushed through all that resistance and we said, we're gonna do this anyway. We're gonna offer a new grant category called Digital Projects for the Public. And I'm happy to say it's still alive and well. And we started to fund some really innovative stuff. We originally had very modest expectations. We thought we would fund websites, museum websites. We would help museums get their collections online. We would um, help use digital tools as a way to, for people to access humanities ideas and resources. But it quickly became clear that the digital space was much more than that, um, which is no news to you, but it was sort of news to me at the time. Um, so we, we quickly realized that we need, what we had got our hands on as a funder was a whole new kind of learning space that had its own pedagogy and its own approaches and needed leadership from funders like the NEH to nurture along a sense of common practice and pedagogy if it was gonna be effective in reaching the public. And remember again, I'm thinking public. I'm not talking about what happens on the college campus or university classrooms. I'm talking about people, lay people. So we started funding um, digital uh, field trips and experimenting with mobile apps. But I have to say that among all the things we funded, the most provocative and the most appealing to all of us on staff were games. And that's what I'm gonna focus on tonight. Um, the, the game space struck us all immediately as a really provocative alternative learning environment. And I wanna talk about that on a couple of levels and then I'll show you a, a clip from one of my favorites. So I think there's several things that make a game a really intriguing learning space. First, and some of these will seem obvious, but I, I, I hope during the conversation we can push deeper. So first, the most obvious one, access. People who, don't, who no longer read books play games. Um, younger generation can be engaged through a game that would not sit down and read a book. That's the most obvious. But also, 
there's access, so that's access on kind of the physical level and intellectual level, but there's also access for people in China to visit virtually the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection who are never going to set foot in the doors of that museum. So access on that level as well. Um, in terms of the game environment as a learning space, it allows for situated learning. It allows for learning that is rooted deeply in a place or in a moment in time. And this is something that if you're a teacher, you long for. You long to be able to create a, an immersion for a student in another moment in time. I've taught history, and one of the most impossible things to teach, really not, uh, not just in the classroom, but the most difficult thing for any of us to grasp, is a sense of contingency and choice. So we know, for example, how the French Revolution came about. We know how it turned out. We know why and how the smallpox vaccine was invented. We know when and why slavery was ended in North America. We know all of these things because we learned them through history books or through lectures or, or from our parents. And there's a sense of inevitability that we absorb about history. And it's almost impossible to unpeel that from your mind, from your understanding of history, and not think that everything was just marching along the way it had to march along. What a game can do is it can take that away from you, that sense of inevitability, and pose an alternative ending, and play around with contingency so that you really are confronted with the fact that things really can work out differently if you make this choice or that choice at this turn in the road. And there's some, there's some fascinating, brilliant people working in the game development field who are playing around with the, with the potential of the game narrative to affect our thinking about choice and contingency. So I hope we can talk more about the, that during the discussion, but I just want to put that out there as, for me, one of the things that's really deeply fascinating about the game space and how it can alter teaching, but really possibly alter our thinking about our place in this moment in time and how we got here. So, and I think because my background is history, that's probably the one that compels me the most. Um, there's also a lot of potential for gaming as what's sometimes called an empathic narrative. A, a, an experience that can place you genuinely in the shoes of someone else, in the heart and mind of someone else in a different moment, different place, different, different point in time. I have to admit to a little bit of skepticism on this point, and we can talk more about that in the in the in the break. But I've seen I've seen it work. In fact, a group of us were just talking about um, a game that a student said moved him or her to tears at some point. I've seen games move people in ways that really surprise me, because um, perhaps because I don't play them that much, or I didn't until five years ago, and I'm much more likely to be moved by a film or a novel or a conversation with a person that I trust. But there is this form that is incredibly powerful as an empathic tool, and an expressive and empathic tool. And I think we've only begun to understand that, that particular power. This is something that's completely fundamental to both the arts and the humanities, to, world, to the worlds that both Peter and I inhabit. The idea that a great novel or a beautiful dance performance or a great game can, can give you access to someone else's mind and heart. That's why we're in this business, right? I mean, that's why I'm in this business. Um, and so that's, I think, for me, why games are so, so exciting. Because um, we know that, that that depth of understanding can be genuinely profound. You don't have to have lived in 19th century Russia to read Anna Karenina and be profoundly moved, right? We know that a, the, a brilliant art form can push right through those particularities of experience that so often divide us. And I've really come to believe that a game, if it's well-crafted and thoughtfully designed, has perhaps even more power than a novel like Anna Karenina to achieve that. So I put that out there for us to argue about later. Um, anyway, I think, I mean, basically what this led me to is that if your mission is public education or teaching, you have to take the game environment seriously as a learning space. We, we just have to wrestle with what those possibilities are. So I'd like to pause for a minute and show you a clip of a game that I think um, will help raise some of, of these interesting questions. It's called Walden. It was developed by Tracy Fullerton 
a really innovative kind of groundbreaking great game designer at USC. Uh, she, she runs the game lab there. It's just released in June 2017 for both Mac and Windows. And in this game, instead of fighting zombies or um, surviving combat, you are put in a first person simulation of the life of Henry David Thoreau, the American philosopher. The game begins in the summer of 1845 when Thoreau has just embarked on his experiment in self-reliant living. And as the player, you follow in him, you follow in his footsteps as he is walking through the woods, building a cabin, gathering firewood, finding food, sewing clothing, and more. And I will, I will pick up this conversation after we watch it. This is about a two minute trailer that gives you an intro to the gameplay. What if we could all go to the woods to live deliberately? reviewed this, they called this the world's most improbable video game, um, right? I mean, taking Henry David Thoreau, who we all think of as, as anti-technology and turning, this, turning it into a video game. But I will tell you that the, the world's leading Thoreau scholars were advisors on this game, and they love it. And they, in fact, one of them said to me, because NEH funded this, this game in part, um, one of them said to me that he believed if Thoreau were alive today, he would be playing video games. But, I mean, he, in fact, was not the utter Luddite that, that we believe him to be. Um, so the gameplay in, the, in this game is, on one level, very, very simple. There's about six hours if you play it straight through. And you're just wandering in the woods. Um, you find food, you make clothing, you read, you write in your journal, you meet with Ralph Waldo Emerson, you go into town. The presence of the technology that Thoreau abhorred and wrote about changing the pace of human life is there. You saw the railroad going by. There are other hints of that technology that were encroaching on the world of, of Walden Pond. And you can write about that and reflect about that. There are quests built in. For example, as you explore the natural envi environment, you come across arrowheads. And you can pick them up and, in the process, learn about the history of the Native Americans who inhabited Walden Pond before Thoreau arrived on the scene. The seasons change. You saw that in the trailer. Each one presents its own challenges and its own, um, its own opportunities for reflection and inspiration. If you don't take the time to reflect, if all you do is hurry about the business of survival, the game changes. The music and the colors start to dim. The music gets thinner, the colors dim, and as a player, you lose energy. You start to feel faint. So in other words, you have to figure out that you need nature to replenish yourself and that you need reflective time if you're going to go about the business, return to the business of survival. It's that balance between survival and reflection, between the reflective life and, the, and our basic human needs for survival that really was what Thoreau was grappling with for those two years at Walden Pond. 
That's what you are forced to grapple with as a player. Nothing in the game tells you that. You have to figure it out as you're playing. Um, what else? I'll read you what the game developer, Tracy Fullerton, says. She says, players cultivate through the game their own thoughts and responses to what they discover. When have you ever heard a, a game that is about a player cultivating their thoughts and responses? It's not about action, it's about reflection. The piece, this is Tracy Fullerton again, the piece has a subtle narrative arc. In homage to the original text, which is not an adventure of the body pitted against nature, but instead an adventure of the mind and soul living in nature over the course of one New England year. Ultimately, what Tracy was hoping to do, and we can argue about whether she did it or not, was to prompt reflective play instead of fast-paced, first-person shooter kind of engagement with games, but ultimately to also raise questions about the personal experience of the natural environment and the personal costs of human progress. The project includes a very ambitious outreach campaign. It, she's trying to get it into schools across the nation, and we don't know yet how kids are engaging with it. It was just released, but I'm really looking forward to the research on how it works in the classroom. I know for a fact, because of the focus group research that I've seen, that in the early days of developing it, kids were responding to this game who were never gonna pick up Walden and read it. So it's in terms of access, it's clearly opening up the world of Henry David Thoreau to a whole new audience that is not gonna encounter him in a book. So I don't know that Walden embodies all of the qualities that, that I think you know, kind of the ideal game um, might embody, but I think it captures the way the digital space has enormous potential to invite discovery and to spark the imagination in ways that are substantively and I think profoundly different from a novel or a dance performance or any other art form that we are used to in our worlds, used to funding and, and thinking about. So this work that I've done over the last five years, I will say has really challenged me as a historian, as a writer and as a funder to think about uh, my work differently. And so I'd like to throw out a couple questions for, and then I'll finish. Um, I'm interested in opening up a conversation about in what ways do these new digital forms challenge us to change our practice? And when I say us, I mean artists, teachers, humanists, thinking people. In what ways are we challenged to change our practice of engaging with each other and thinking about our purpose? And I think that challenge for me is clear in three areas. First, on the level of creativity, the most obvious one, right? The new possibilities for artistic expression, that are presented by digital space are, you know, we could talk about that for hours. The potential for, for collaboration, you know, a, a digital app that lets a composer in Peru collaborate with a composer in China. The, the possibilities for artistic collaboration and expression that weren't there before. But also, and I think this is the most provocative, changing our ideas of narrative. So this, we're used to narrative as something that's linear whether it's a text or a performance that has a beginning and an end or a museum exhibit where you enter there and you exit there. And you know that in the digital space, nothing is linear. So what does that do to our pedagogy as teachers? What does that do to our encounter as students with new ideas when we're not encountering ideas in, in a fixed sequence? Uh, I think that's really fun to think about. So that's, that's a whole bucket of questions about creativity. Second, inclusion not just access to new audiences, like the kid I mentioned who's never gonna pick up Walden but will, might get engaged by the game, but in what ways are, do we, does, with digital space, are we able to include people in the conversation who otherwise might not sit down with us to talk and to interact? And then related, a whole set of issues about community. So there are games that pose ethical choices um, that are profoundly about our relationship to ourself and to others. There's a game that puts you in the, um, in the role of a border guard, deciding who gets to enter uh, a refugee camp. There is a game actually that takes place in the Syrian refugee camp and tries to get you to think about what would your experience be fleeing your country and settling in a new land. There's a whole, a whole movement of games that are motivated by 
goals of getting people to think about social change and social justice. So what are the possibilities for the game space for having us think about ourselves and our relationship to each other and our communities differently? When I went to, a couple of weekends ago, to a, a terrific conference that Peter's shop um, put on at the, at here, right, at the University of Vermont on the double-edged sword of technology. One of the speakers quoted Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities. And the quote was about the idea of community in anonymity. And what Benedict Anderson was talking about was a group of people, I think, in a, in a public space on a subway train, all reading the same newspaper in isolation, not talking to each other, but because they were all experiencing the same narrative bounded by that printed page, they were in some sense having, engaging in a belief that they, they were connected in some way. Talk about a metaphor for digital, digital space. Um, so I think the digital space, you know, everybody's talking about the digital space and its potential to forge community, but what are the dimensions and the depth and the texture of that community? How do we enact it? How do we nurture it so that it's really meaningful to ourselves and to the wider human community? So I'll leave you with that question. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, did you want to? Sure. Um, well, those are terrific remarks. And, and um, uh, just to pick up on one thread um, that Karen mentioned, empathy, I think, is a key ingredient to the humanities, whether it's whatever the discipline is. It has to do with not um, feeling for someone else, but feeling as someone else. Um, that's what literature, Greek literature mm -hmm. does. That's what history does. It helps us uh, experience the narrative that happens in the past. That's the m m miracle of uh, the written word, of history, of literature, is you can actually know the thoughts of a person who's been dead for 2,000 years. When you think about that, that is really bizarre. That's really extraordinary. Um, unfortunately, I think we've lost, many of us have lost that lesson. We've lost the lesson that uh, literature can be enormously powerful. Um, uh, I'm glad that we have uh, uh, emerging media that are picking up um, and capturing people through um, different means. Um, but I'd also like to grab those people and, and show them uh, the power of a short poem, the power of a sentence, the power of a short story, the short power of a movie. You all know, you, you all, know all of those things. Um, a, lot of, there, a, book, a, a game like Walden will, I think, engage some people, bring them to the table in some way. How far, how long they sit at that table, how far they go along this journey, we don't know. But my hope would be that some of those people would say, this is kind of interesting. I've got to find out about this guy Thoreau. I'm going to pick up that book. And then they'll sit down and maybe um, read a little bit in it and about it um, and follow those threads other places. Why? Because it started here. It started somewhere for them. Um, so uh, anytime we can have experiences that put us in the shoes of other people, uh, we're doing uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, too often, I think the stereotype would be that we objectify in the violence of uh, video games um, antisocial behavior and do things that are really uh, pernicious uh, to um, individuals and society. Um, there are ways, as, as Karen has pointed out, that we can do just the opposite, or that the opposite can be done. Um, those shared texts, those shared experiences are, uh, whether it's all reading the same book in private, um, that's what journalism does. That's what, when we make a passing reference to something and everybody smiles because you know that song by Madonna or you know that poem by Frost or you, whatever, um, there's a connection there that uh, matters a lot, not only in the, in the subtlety and the efficiency of communication, but also the binds that they, the bonds that they create. So I we really do want this to be a conversation. So I'm I'm hoping to pass the mic to somebody and um, and start a conversation. Does anybody have a question or a comment that was raised? Hi, um, I'm really interested in the 
idea that we all experience the information that's being provided, whatever the medium is, simultaneously and therefore experience some sort of connection. Um, when we're talking about digital media that allow us to manipulate the experience, have we had any kind of connection? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, so let me start with a story. Um, in the 1990s, when the internet was a new thing, um, I know some of you won't remember that, but I remember it. I was at a New Year's Eve party with my best friends, and we stayed up late drinking too much wine, and we were arguing about, don't laugh, is the internet a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> But the substance of our conversation, you know, as, I mean, it sounds like a ridiculous question, but it wasn't such a ridiculous question in the early 1990s. But the substance of our question was, is it going to isolate us or is it going to bring us together? And we, had, we were passionately on opposite ends of, of, of that spectrum. Um, and, I, you know, the question that you've raised is, is really, for me, the crux of the matter. If you, like, how do you how do you forge something shared from a digital experience? And is it in what, that's what I meant by saying, how do we nurture it and enact it and build it so that it's meaningful? Because just saying that we're both on the same, you know, looking at the same um, digital information is not community. Uh, any more than those people sitting on the subway both reading the same newspaper, they might have had the perception of community, but one was taking away this message and one was taking away that message and if they're not exchanging ideas or affecting each other in any way, to me that's not community. So that's, I'd love to know what other people think. One, one quick uh, response or addition to that, it may actually make it more shared and more authentic and more connected because in life we have, um, the two of us see the same thing or read the same book and we do have radically different sometimes reactions to it. You found that character sympathetic. The person we just met, you actually thought he was a decent guy. I thought he was a scoundrel. Then there's a little exchange about that and I learned a little bit from you and you learned a little bit from me. Uh, the fact that we don't, that we aren't in lockstep is, closer to reality, it's closer to the way we live our lives, whether it's in, in art or uh, uh, literature or, or a game. Well, and I'm glad you said that, because this uh, I, I recently had sort of rebuilt this argument with a, a new friend, and I was saying, you know, if you're, if, if you're existing in this digital world over here and talking to people like you and looking at at photo art, you know, you're the architecture of this environment. So you're choosing what images you see and who you interact with. And I'm creating my own digital environment over here. How can we find a shared map of the world? And she basically looked at me and said, Karen, we've never had a shared map of the world. This is not yeah. about exactly as you're yeah. saying, you know, you're you're naive if you thought that human beings have ever walked around with a shared map of the world. That's not the nature of human experience. It's just that we're reacting to these new tools as if they're altering our experience. I'm not sure I buy that 100%, but, but it's... Well, you have much more I'm, to say... I'm there with you 80%. You, know, you have much more to say uh, about a movie that you've just watched with somebody who disagrees with you than somebody who says, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's not, any, it's not very interesting. Um, uh, and it's um, rare. Hi. Um, I have a question about learning through play, and mm -hmm. I wanted to ask it about the Walden game because I think it's, it's exciting and a really great case study. Um, and so I've sort of bridged two worlds in my life, one the sort of digital media-making world and one the free play, unstructured play, experiential ed, outdoor play world. And those two worlds hate each other. <laughs> and so I, I think the Walden game is really exciting, but I can think of my mentor at PlayCore in Providence saying, if they play that game, they're looking at screens and they're not going outside into the world and having their own experience where like, which isn't circumscribed by a narrative designed by somebody else. And so my question is, how can these two forms of play be in productive conversation with each other? Um, and is that possible? That's a big question. <laughs> Hi. Um, 
So m my background is I did history for my undergrad and now I'm a game writer for my mm -hmm. master's. Um, so what I thought of immediately when you were talking about that is um, unstructured play to me, and I actually got to play Walden and it's a great game. It's a really cool game. And I didn't actually realize there even was a narrative. To me, it was simply unstructured play. Um, and unstructured play to me is uh, another term. It means the same thing to me as the emergent narrative, which is also something that Karen was bringing up. Um, an emergent narrative is, um, it's not the story that anybody hands you. It's, um, it's rather that somebody creates a world for you to explore. And uh, it's a story that you, as a player or the viewer, create for yourself by virtue of your actions and your choices that you make in the world. Um, so for me, uh, emergent narrative is is really the same thing as unstructured play. And I think as um, game designers, some, like something I'm working on is uh, moving away, precisely moving away from linear uh, storytelling and into creating spaces that are really just opportunities for players to make their own stories. So I think that there is a lot of overlap in what you're talking about. So this makes me think two different things. First, the people who are at Walden Pond in Concord have installed a kiosk so that people who actually come to the <laughs> physical space play the game, which if you think about it, I, I'm a little makes no sense, right? Because they're there in this beautiful natural environment why don't they just take a walk and explore Walden Pond? But in fact, what they are finding, and it's still, you know, this game was just released, so I think we have some time to figure out how this really works, but what they're finding is that people move back and forth almost seamlessly between those experiences. So, and, and this gets to your point of how can those two worlds be united productively? I think, in fact, if you just let children alone, in particular, they do move very readily back and forth between those two modes of experiencing the world, and they don't think it's jarring the way that we do. There's mm -hmm. some really good research in the children's museum field about that, in fact. Um, and I, I have a hunch that's what they're gonna find at Walden Pond, and that's what the curator's interested in seeing. People don't do one in place of the other. They feel like they're mutually reinforcing and that one deepens their experience of the other. And it's something that I have to say I don't quite get on a personal level because I would much rather be out there walking around the pond than sitting at a kiosk. But I know that that's not true for other people. And I, I, I see the research and I see it happening in sort of the light in people's faces when they're discovering this environment through the game. And those two modes do, there is a way that they, I don't think we have to do anything to facilitate that experience, it happens. So, I mean, you're asking a bigger question, I think a pedagogical question about how can we as teachers facilitate bringing those worlds together, which I think is a really interesting question, which I absolutely don't have the answer to. But and also, BG, how can we create uh, as humanists a productive conversation between those two groups that see themselves as diametrically opposed when they're clearly not right. so articulated? <laughs> But just, can I, can I just ask, I don't know your name, the, the yeah. okay, so Dana, so I have a question about the games that, that have that kind of self-directed narrative, and this is a question for anyone in the room who's played them. That to me feels like one of the most profoundly isolating experiences. You are in, you are actually constructing your own reality as you play that, a game like that. Um, and I've played a couple of them, and they're completely mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. And you know, five hours can go by, and you don't even know that the time's gone by. Mm -hmm. But you are utterly, utterly, utterly creating your own reality in those five hours. That's, to me, a little scary. Mm -hmm. How, then, do you ever create a bridge between that experience and the experience of another person? That's, it's not fair to ask you that question, but, but I mean. Um, it, it was, what, in what way is it scary, did you um, say? Because it's so profoundly isolating. And isolating um, in the way like you felt like you were alone or, I mean, I'm curious what. Yeah, so I don't think it links me in any uh, meaningful way to someone else in another room or classroom or country who's playing mm -hmm. the same game. Mm -hmm. In the way that if two people are reading a great novel, they might, they might, there might be places that they can come together at their local library to talk about those ideas. There, you share 
a great novel with your friends in a book club or with your mother or with your sister. Yeah. You don't share the experience of playing one of those games with somebody else because it is a very deeply personal experience. So I, I think it's there's something yeah. fundamental. So, so I find that really jarring when I think about its impact on us as a human community. I, I think there's a, a lot of hands kind of going up from some of us who have played some of these kinds of games. Yeah, please. You find the other people that How? have uh, online through forums, uh, even in libraries looking up the same kinds of materials. Uh, I, I had assumed when you said it was isolating that you would have that kind of play experience. You build your own narrative and you would be unable to share that narrative with somebody else um, because it was, it was self-driven. But I think of games where uh, people have to face a similar challenge and even if it's a real open world experience, you run into this particular challenge and, and you don't know how to get around it and so you start finding videos of other people who played it and how they got around it. You start talking to other players uh, about what techniques they were using. You start showcasing your own ability because uh, you think that you've come up with a better solution than they did. Uh, there's, there's a lot of community that can be built um, even in those very personal play experiences. Hmm. And I think I saw your hand, but I'm not sure. Oh. You said most of what I was going to be. And the only thing I would add is that the companies that are making these games are the smarter ones actually doing things to encourage those communities to, to come into being and to exist, be it running forums or what have you, because they know that increases the value of the product. Mm -hmm. I, I think, too, that a lot of those self-directed games um, run on the same kind of juice you're talking about with Walden. I mean, the experience is all about uh, your sense of choice and agency and the narrative that emerges from that. So it has a lot of that, um, that built into it. And um, there was one other point I wanted to make about that. Oh, I, he, not to go off in this direction, but I've played some of those games, and they do feel maybe a little bit isolating because you are sort of having that experience alone. And one of the things that's different about that from, say, reading a novel, which can be a very intimate experience, even though you don't know who in the world is reading that novel at the same time, is that there is not really as strongly uh, felt presence of an author, authorial hand. You know, every time you pick up a novel, you, especially the ones that I pick up, which are always written by people who, you know, who have died years ago, I know all about them, but um, you, you have that sense that, that, that another human being created this and that you're being kind of spoken to or communicated with in some way. And, you know, we, we know that these games are, are the product of uh, large development teams and um, the good ones cover their tracks and they leave you alone. And so you really do feel alone. I get, I get what you're saying about that. Well, and there's the illusion that's deliberately created for you that you are the author of your experience, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a really interesting point because you don't have that that imaginary connection to the author or the the choreographer or the painter or that you're right. It's because the, the game developer doesn't want you to have that relationship. They want you to believe that you are the author of your own experience. And that's a profoundly different relationship to just experience than most art forms that I'm used to. So, Also, I think it ends. Like you said, you can get fully immersed into that experience for hours and hours on end, and you are alone and isolated in that space while you're doing it. And, you know, you, you, you hear, you know, I've seen and experienced myself that I might sit down to play a fun little game and two or three hours have passed and I don't even realize it where when you're consuming traditional media, there is an end <laughs> that's predetermined. And you might read a book a second time or watch a movie over and over again, but there's a finite time associated with it. It's not this bottomless pit, which also I think feels isolating to me anyways, because you're alone with the screen. Mm -hmm. Even if you're, even with games I think in which you're having digital communications with through avatars or even with you know through conversations i mean my i watch my kids play video games and they all have their headphones on and they're playing virtually with their friends from the other side of town and having conversations while doing it but it's still you're alone with the screen for an undeterminate amount of time that also i think changes things for me Um, so I want to take things back uh, for a minute to 
communities and specifically digital communities. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when we're talking about sort of traditional communities, communities that existed prior to things like the digital age, um, the one of the main bases, one of the main bases that community was founded on was dependence, reliance, and consequence with other people. So if you have to live with people, you have to see them every day, you have to take responsibility for your actions, you depend on them socially, emotionally, economically, all those sorts of things. And I think anyone who spent any great amount of time on the internet can see that there's a lot of toxicity that can frequently come up in communities when anonymity is assumed. Mm -hmm. So that people do not feel like they have to respond to the consequences of their actions and therefore can just kind of make a mess of things that other people would rather they didn't. So do you think that there's any sense in which digital communities n should have more accountability towards individuals or more ways to make it so that consequences are more real to people as opposed to something that can be just sort of shoved off and you get more of an illusion of community where it's more just like feelings or ideas being exchanged rather than concrete uh, you know, cur currency of emotion or economics or uh, those sorts of things. You're the uh, humanities person you, <laughs> you well, tackle that it's, it's an interesting question. I guess the question you ask is the one that society in the marketplace would be asking. Um, how that decision is made um, it would happen in a variety of ways, I suppose. But I suppose if it gets so bad that nobody goes there anymore, like Yogi Berra's um, full restaurant, uh, mm -hmm. if, if the places are so toxic that that people lose interest in the thing. Somebody may, a new sheriff may bring order to the place. Um, and it's a balance between, well, how about freedom and unity, to coin a phrase, the tension between um, obligation and autonomy. Well, I, I guess what I'm asking is, would it be worthwhile to try to pursue making digital spaces have more accountability to individuals? Is anonymity destructive of communities when we're talking about digital spaces? And would it be worth trying to have some way, like uh, in some multiplayer games that I've had, there is a great respect for um, the social community that goes on in these games, in large part because there is a huge amount of time put into your character in the game and into the world itself. And therefore, when th other players mess with that and when they do things with it, there is a strongly felt emotional reaction against it, which other players can you know, act as sheriffs and act as real forces to try to get things back into a real kind of community control. And in other areas, when anonymity is much more widespread, that kind of social pressure doesn't exist in the same way. And therefore, it's a lot harder to create a real community, one where people's actions mean things and where people are actually trying to pay attention to one another and you know, have their actions, have some reciprocity, basically. So is there, you know, might, might it be something that digital communities need to do to try to really reach out towards the people who are actually there and connect them more firmly than just having a name that comes up whenever you're um, espousing something on the internet? Is that kind of implied social contract that you're talking about, is that something that has arisen organically or is it built into the architecture of the game that you're playing? Um, is this, um, this is largely organic. This okay. is um, basic, this is, yeah, no, this is basically yeah. like the more, you know, yeah. the more time you put into something, the more you care about yeah. it. So and, I, I mean, yeah. I would say there's your answer. I think those kinds of forms of policing or control should emerge organically and shouldn't be, I, I, I'd be really reluctant to say that it's anyone's job to create that kind of uh, structure, but that's just my, that's a philosophical question. Our, our society generally, uh, 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 looks with uh, some suspicion at anonymity. We permit it in places where it's needed mm -hmm. to, protect, to protect victims, um, to protect people who are in positions of, of, of weakness um, against uh, uh, retribution and the like. But usually uh, our society says, no, no, let's, who are you? Put a face um, to a name. Put a face to a name mm -hmm. so that I can understand where you're coming from. I can judge your credibility. I can um, find a connection with you. Um, uh, that's the way society, live society, is built, uh, at least in this, in the West. Absolutely, mm -hmm. um, and I think this is also related to you know everyone likes talking about fake news nowadays, and mm -hmm. I think that there is a, 
Um, I think that that lack of accountability towards individuals and the idea that you can just go on the internet and edit Wikipedia or you can just go on and post anything on some particular journalism website, I think there is something about the kinds of communities that spring up online that has this high potential at least for deception and for um, kind of creating areas in which policing becomes very difficult. And I don't know, I'm, I'm mo I don't really know exactly where my question is going, but I do want to bring up the um, link between um, anonymity consequence and what those things have to say about what kinds of communities are real and which ones are more illusory. Mm -hmm. Um, I, my, my question is somewhat related. So as I, I'm listening to you speak, I, I, I'm he hearing some similarities between uh, some traditional, um, tr more traditional media, such like poems and novels and the like, and, and video games. Um, they're both potential engines for cultivating empathy. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And they both kind of operate by immersion. They achieve those effects in different ways. You know, in, in a short story or a novel, we have to decode the language, and that kind of unlocks it, and we and we, we fall into it. Uh, and it works in different ways in video games. Um, but we've been defending literature, some of us, for a long time, on, on many grounds. One of which is that it's it provides a useful literacy. Right? There's a link between literature and literacy. Let's say. Um, and so I'm asking the question now about about these digital spaces. Have you thought much about the literacies that emerge from that? How do those stand up? And I think it relates a little bit to what you were saying because we're, 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 we're asking, so what, what, what do I become when I play these games and what does that matter in how I actually interact with real people? There's a huge literature on this that I'm not, I, I can't. Um, speak to except to say that it's there. I mean, Kathy Davidson has written some, written some really interesting work on how um, the game environment and digital space affects kids cognitively and builds different skill sets than traditional, you know, reading a book or a poem. I mean, there, there, there are psychologists and neuroscientists who are studying this. So the answer to your question is yes, there is a, there is a profound difference, and there is there are different skill sets that are being developed, but I. That's not my background. I can't speak to that. Um, I, I would also argue that um, you know, if you were a dyslexic, <laughs> mm -hmm. that growing you know growing up a hundred years ago, you um, you know you are at a, you're left behind, right? So the the our, our traditional form of literacy, um, you know, uh, affords success to certain kinds of brains, and I think what we're going to find in the next, you know, however many years, is that this new form of digital literacy is going to afford success to a different kind of intelligence. And, you know, we, we will change, right? How will change remains to be seen. And it also, hopefully, will change pedagogy in the classroom. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, we're very focused on individual learners and the proficiencies or skills that they develop that we can measure and, and grant them credit to graduate. And we know the little that, I, that I've read, I know that the digital space encourages a kind of collaborative learning that isn't just e easily defined by, you know, you have this skill set and I have this skill set. Kids in a classroom that's digitally that where the, the pedagogy is shaped by digital tools from the get-go, they learn differently, they interact differently, and it's a much more fluid and collaborative kind of learning that doesn't lend itself to that kind of individual measurement. So talk about a vast sea change being required in our classrooms. Um, we've been using the word uh, uh, education. The, mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, emerging media are uh, excellent at experiential education, exp coming to understand something through experience. I'm not convinced that uh, it, is, it is equal to books when it comes to information or knowledge. Um, it's important to know a variety of things, um, um, citizenship, tolerance, and a variety of other important themes that one could learn experientially. But our society also needs people that knows about the balance of uh, um, powers in our government 
and um, how many Supreme Court justices there are. That may sound dull, but if you don't have that fundamental understanding, um, you get real problems. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, and it's important for people to have a shared knowledge. And you know, you know the, the best way to convey, that I know of, to convey information is the written word. That it hasn't gotten any better. You can have it said to you, but I can read faster than that, even if I'm not a fast reader. But information, that kind of knowledge of uh, that the Civil War happened before World War II, um, uh, is gotten best, most efficiently, through reading. So there are different kinds of learning that happen. Um, I wanted to revisit a, um, something that came up earlier about, um, it seems like in this conversation we've had a lot of um, worrying about digital technology taking the place of reading or them um, kind of being at odds with one another. Um, and I had a professor, Ken Howell, who's a teacher here, who um, said once that um, culture is a luxury item. And I think that as our technology gets better, as we are able to have more free time, we're actually spending more time uh, entertaining ourselves in general, whatever that medium may be. A couple years ago, I did a paper on eschatological themes in television, and I was studying um, how television habits have changed over time. Um, and separate from the whole Netflix and Hulu and everything else kind of replacing traditional cable television, one thing that I found that was interesting was um, all of these broadcast networks are kind of uh, freaking out, worrying that people are going to be watching less television because they're on the internet more. And it's true that people were spending more time on the internet in 2014 than they were in 2005. but. Um, they were still spending the same amount of time watching television. And so to extrapolate that a little bit further back, I think that we're seeing um, people just in general spending more time with all forms of media. And so maybe it isn't as much of a battle for real estate in people's minds as we're portraying it to be. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Holly, did you have a question? I just was going to comment and I really appreciate the comment about television, obviously, but um, <laughs> the uh, um, comment that you had, Peter, about a shared knowledge, I, my, I still can't get over the idea that when you create your own reality in a digital format, you aren't having an expression of an art form in the same way that creates a common culture, even though, to your original point, Peter, people even see color differently and they have interpretations that are different. But you don't give yourself over to the attempt of human communication in the art form in the same way when you're doing um, this digital interactive experience. And I do worry, as a purveyor of Ken Burns documentaries, that there is a need for a common culture that even goes beyond mere information. Just saying. Well, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, and I worry, just to heap on the, the, the curmudgeonness here, um, that I worry about, uh, about yeah, that's your job, I know, I'm still your job. Um, no, but I worry about uh, abandoning linear narrative, you know, to be very traditional. I mean, Ken Burns documentaries are a great example. I used to fund Ken Burns documentaries. So. Um, you know, there's a there's an incredible beauty and power to a narrative that's beautifully constructed to move you from here to here. It moves you emotionally, it moves you intellectually, and you don't you don't get to here without knowing what you learned over here. It matters that you go in a sequence. It matters the way the story unfolds. If you're in a space where you just get to bounce around and pick up content the way you choose, something is lost. I. I can't give up on that idea, and I'd love someone to push back against that who's younger than I am, because I, I fear I'm betraying my age here. So I'm going to have a question uh, that's probably probably different than everything else uh, about sustainability. And one of the things I've been talking about in some of my classes now is that it's really we want to get into a more sustainable age where we're using sustainable materials and uh, how do we teach the uh, humanities using sustainable technology? Um, for example, you know, why would we use the books when it's more sustainable to use the digital technology uh, because it can last longer and it doesn't have to 
you know, destroy the environment as we do it. So I'm wondering, uh, I know it's a different experience using a book to learn about the humanities compared to using uh, another device, but how would uh, we get into this future age where we can actually be sustainable but still learn about the humanities? Can I, let me push back on that. I mean, I, you know, I've had the same book for, you know, in my family for 100 years, and I can read the same one, and I can hand it and lend it to you. You, I've changed your computer uh, at least once in the last five years. Um, and that has a lot of toxic materials in it. It has things that are uh, limited resources. It's really hard to recycle. Um, and a paper, uh, and, and it uses power. Um, and and uh, a book doesn't do any of those things. It's incredibly cheap. Once it's purchased, it is free. You can read it a million times, and it's free. That's yeah. true. No, that's, that's true. And also, I'm I'm thinking about uh, space, like uh, the amount of space a book takes up, where is a file is not that big, right. and it can go on anywhere. I'm just thinking about the future of where we're going. Like, you know, you, we not we're not going to have bookshelves uh, in out in outer space or something like that. It's gonna you know has to be in a digital format. So I'm just wondering, how are we going to deal with that when that time comes when we're like we can't use books anymore? Well, I would just suggest that you uh, look into the carbon footprint of like Amazon Web Services, for example. Like, you know, we at Champlain use Canvas as our learning management system that's hosted by Amazon. There's these giant cavernous warehouse buildings out in Nevada or something that are just chewing up electricity to, to keep those servers running. And, you know, they're multiply redundant and all of that. So, I mean, there's actually studies done of like what the actual carbon footprint of a tweet is. Uh, and you know, just multiply that by the billions that occur every day. Like those, there's power required. There's storage space required. The cloud. I mean, we have a colleague, Brian Murphy, who who talks about this, and he's like, the cloud is is not the cloud. It's it's a physical reality. There's this massive infrastructure supporting it. So, sustainability is a tricky thing in the digital yeah, age. That true. is not as you know, we can grow more trees, uh, <laughs> print more books if we if we want to go that way. But uh, so yeah. I think the funny pushback would be like, uh, when it all goes to hell, I don't think we'll be worrying about like how we're going to be able to plug our laptops in because the only thing that will be left are books. So that would be <laughs> okay. Well, we got to read these now. Um, I think um, a, a funny thing, uh, and we're talking a lot about how where does all this additional media fit into the larger landscape, and I, I always think that if you look back historically, whenever a new sort of form of, form of communication bursts onto the scene and gets sort of a foothold. The ones that were there before are freaking out. The new one always thinks it's going to take over the world and then it's going to be the only thing. And the end result is always the same. The end result is always that the new thing just becomes another thing. And then a new thing comes along and then the same sort of dance takes place. My question is, and I have no idea, and I don't know if anyone else has an idea, is do you think that the human brain will ever reach a threshold where there will be so many things that will be spread so thin that we become sort of the, you know, jack of all trades and master of none intellectually. Like, is that something that's maybe a legitimate concern that we have so many different methods of communication that we are not good at any of them? Oh, no, I um, Yeah, no, no more new things, right? But I think you're right. Um, I'm not gonna answer your question, but I will um, kind of piggyback a little bit on what you said uh, your, is that I think as these new media come into play, I think the old media gets to figure out what it's best for, right? Sure. And I think that, as you pointed out, there are certain things in which the written word is better at communicating, but I think there are certain things that the branching narrative possibility of a video game are also better at. And now we get to stop making books do all of the heavy lifting for everything and everybody, and we get to start diversifying that experience. Um, I wanna hear what you have to say, but I also wanna call attention to the time. It's a, I think it's a little bit after eight o'clock already, so I think um, we should maybe have a couple of last comments, and then we can um, wrap it up, and if anybody wants to stay and talk afterwards, but go ahead. I think you're absolutely right. That, um, and the trick would be in any kind of project like this is to use multimedia. Um, they match up very well. If you um, use some um, uh, um, 
an emerging technology um, um, narrative. You could also have text, you could have audio, you can have video. Um, uh, and you, together, those create a, uh, a good balance and a good combination. They are also collaborative. I've got one thing and you've got the other thing. You've got the letters from that great person and we can put them on and you have a fabulous interview so I wanted to use that and you have film of the place and together we can have a terrific product but it's the product of four things or five things or eight things and 20 people and not just one. Um, so one of the interesting dynamics when you think about collaboration and community like this is an interdisciplinary class right so there are people who are like more maybe con traditional media makers digital media makers like that coming together and that always feels like really really exciting um and like i'm in that headspace too is a is a like a creator and as a thinker i do media studies but from me but but like one of the sticking points is about funding always mm -hmm. who is getting money and I, I was just curious about like your perspective on funding because I read a lot about like the crisis in the humanities and that crisis is necessitated by a like a defunding that has been happening over the course of the past 20 to 30 years which is happening in the US at the federal and state and institutional levels I see it playing out um, even in our own local sphere, so the defunding of the humanities um, with the funding of like technologists who are creating humanities-ish type educational things to create empathy-ish. Um, and so, but, but without the context or the experience of the humanities, and then like the humanities people are expected to, oh, let's come play with you and we'll collaborate, but we're not gonna actually give you money. Um, and so I'm curious as to how that dynamic like plays into this conversation about um, like education, humanities, and digital technologies and whatnot, and what your perspectives are on it. I'm considering like you're both operating in those spaces. I have no money, so. <laughs> I don't fund anyone. <laughs> so I think the question for me as a funder is the one circling back to what Robin said, which is what if I'm going to make decisions as a funder, what, what is the best form to accomplish the kind of public community engagement that at the Arts Council or formerly at the National Endowment for the Humanities we want to foster. And sometimes that might be a traditional humanities form and sometimes it might be a new digital form. The, I, don't, I don't think, I, I think funders need to think strategically about what is the best medium to achieve their ends. And it, and it should be a blend of traditional and digital. I mean, that's easy to say in an environment where you know, STEM is ascendant and the humanities have to claw away, you know, to, to get any attention. But I have to say, maybe I'm an incurable optimist, but when I left DC, I did feel a bit that that was changing. I mean, even, you know, despite all the, the threats of defunding the arts endowment and the humanities endowment, I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't think there's an appetite for that. And I also believe that most of the funders of STEM are recognizing that arts and humanities can amplify and and deepen the work that's happening in STEM because the research is is there now and the research wasn't there ten years ago. Um, so you know, I mean, and, and that matters. That turns the funder's head. If you can demonstrate learning change in the classroom, change in student achievement through engagement with the arts or humanities alongside STEM or instead of STEM, it. It matters. And so I feel like there is a change in the last, I don't know, I wouldn't want to say an exact number of years, but it feels like in the last maybe five to 10 years because of research and that funders are taking notice, that some of the larger foundations and government funders, um, including the Department of Education, are taking notice and there's a more integrated approach. But again, I tend to be an incurable optimist, so. I don't know if you have the same perspective. No, I think it's true. I know that uh, the Department of Education in Vermont um, just hired a STEAM special content specialist, not a STEM content specialist. So I think that's true. I think there is a little bit of a of a movement. A uh, couple of, of quick comments. The first was uh, I was actually going to suggest that you're you worry less about the linear narrative and you take some uh, take a deep breath because the fact of the matter is, although the 
uh, playground type approach. Sandboxes are cool. Uh, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of games today are still fundamentally linear narratives with stuff we throw on top, which is smoke and mirrors to make the player think they have some agency. Um, the other comment I was going to make, just to support Sam a little bit, is you were mentioning they've measured the carbon footprint of, of Google, but, and, but have they measured the carbon footprint of the room I have devoted to books in my house and the room that every other friend I have has devoted to their books and the, all, the, all the identical copies of, uh, of uh, the Asimov Foundation trilogy? So um, I think, unless there's any other last comments, questions, maybe, um, I, think, I, think we're, I think we're good. I think thank we, you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for much. coming. Thanks.